Our next person on the agenda is Lori Metkowski from Gannett Fleming. She works with me there. It's definitely my pleasure to introduce her because uh, Lori came to work with us last November uh, as our director of Connected Automated Vehicle Services, but I've had the pleasure of knowing Lori for almost 10 years and seeing her leadership across the nation in the area of transportation systems management and operations. So it's a great pleasure of mine to be able to come to work every day and work with somebody I truly consider as a friend. I do, as far as bio goes, I can say that uh, she is a graduate of Clemson. She, uh, among the important things she does, she's very passionate about empowering women uh, in the workplace. And she's part of Gannett Fleming's Connected Women um, Advocacy Group. She's also um, very active nationally in WTS um, and spends a lot of time trying to mentor young women professionals in our in our industry. So um, I enjoy working with Lori uh, quite a bit. She was also elected yesterday as the first uh, ever Automated Vehicle Coalition president. So uh, we told her that there was a 90-minute presentation reserved for the president's inauguration <laughs> address, oh. but uh, she politely declined that. Um, and so she's going to come up and finish the, uh, the technical tracks, and then after that I'm going to turn it back over to Haroon to talk about uh, or to uh, facilitate the expert panel. But before Lori takes the podium, I just think we uh, need to recognize Haroon and the Phoenix Contact folks here because their hospitality and the work they put in to preparing for today's uh, conference was top notch. So let's take a moment and just recognize the Phoenix Contact team. Uh, I have to say that um, this is not Haroon, actually. It was a whole lot of people. We had about eight or nine people working from our company, along with uh, about the same number of people working from Gannett Fleming. So it was a very large team. And really, if I start naming names, uh, I'm sure I'll upset somebody that I didn't mention them. So it was a very large team. Let me just say that it was a joint effort. It was uh, um, a, a team effort, and I think at the end, it came together. So thank you very much, Gannett Fleming also, and the entire marketing team from both companies. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lori and uh, let her talk to you about her topic. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm mic'd up here. That looks interesting. Okay, so um, today it just takes some time to um, look back, look forward on connected automated vehicles, on smart cities, smart communities, uh, transportation operations, um, IoT, ITS. I'm going to cover kind of looking at high level about all uh, of all of that. I'm going to present to you a case study on smart cities and. Uh, leave you with a challenge, a challenge to um, think about connectivity, about partnerships, and about planning in this world. Um, I, I hope that you'll indulge me for a few minutes as I read you a poem. It's by uh, Shel Silverstein, 1970s. He's a child, children's author, and he wrote a poem that I read to my, uh, my daughters, and they're, they're eight and uh, 11 now. But um, Love the Shel Silverstein books, and I ran across this poem. I said, you know what? I'm going to use this someday, and I have used it a couple times. So the poem is called Traffic Light. The traffic light simply would not turn green, so the people stopped to wait. As the traffic rolled by, and the wind blew cold, and the hour grew dark and late. Zoom, vroom, trucks, trailers, bikes, and limousines, no CAV, but... Bikes and limousines clattering by, me oh my, won't that light turn green? But the days turned weeks, and the weeks turned months, and there on the corner they stood, twiddling their thumbs till the changing comes the way good people should. And if you walk by that corner now, you may think it's rather strange to see them there as they hopefully gaze with the very same smile on their very same face as they patiently stand in the very same place and wait for the light to change. So we don't want to wait, right? 
we want to get together, we want to figure out solutions. And this was the 1970s, but I think that some of the mentality is still here today. How do we move forward? How do we calculate that anticipation? What are the ingredients? What's the formula? Is it a basic formula of calculation? Is it a complex formula? It's both, really, right? So we're at this crossroads. Um, so we're standing on the corner, like the poem says, and can we make the right decisions? Uh, do we have the right people, the right technology, policy, drive? When I say the right people, um, are the people working in this industry representative of the people we serve? Less than 20% of engineering students are, are, are females, less than 20%, but that's not representative of the people that we serve and, and who we're working for. So um, there's workforce development issues, um, not only in the technology, but also in the diversity of the workforce. Um, what are the policies? You heard great um, conversation this morning from our policy leaders, and, and there's some disparaging views of what our industry knows versus the policy side, and so we need better connection there. And what is our drive? What, what is our drive to really have these um, policies and workforce and all that, what is the drive? Is it to um, have a better way of life? I think so. It, it, because technology has changed the way they, we operate um, for a long time. Uh, that, that poem in the 70s is just the traffic light changes whenever uh, the timer goes down. But it's changed now. It's changed radically. Um, so we think about the way we live and how we use technology to live, but we want technology to help us live better lives, to give us more time. Um, and, and it seems kind of counterintuitive as, the, as we move closer to technology, we want to also move closer to having more time and being more grounded and having more time to spend outside. Um, technology helps us do that in a way. So um, there's this, uh, and I talk about smart cities in the realm of connected automated vehicles and the realm of transportation because they are so um, closely connected. And when we say smart cities, we think about how these different layers um, help influence and help um, make decisions for each other. And, and I mean, what I mean by that is let's take water, your water supply system. Well, can you look at uh, a neighborhood and, and take all the data from a neighborhood and say, okay, the water um, system is being surged at a certain time. So that must mean that people are getting up, they're getting ready for work. Okay, well, where is the employment center? Okay, so now the water system is surging over here, then it's gonna go over here, and oh, well, people must get there somehow, right? So the transportation, so then you can say, okay, let's go to transportation, say there's gonna be surge on your transportation system. And in what way, what modes? So then you can look at your transit system. Then you can look, you know, bikes may be one of them. Pedestrians, how are people getting to work? And what about your power system? How does that influence other lines? That's that smart city approach to use the data and um, to really figure out what's going on and how each can, how you can make better decisions. So. The US DOT put out this Smart City Challenge. Uh, 78 different cities answered that. Um, that was in 2015. Uh, Pittsburgh was one of the seven finalists, and the finalist was Columbus, as we all know. Um, so they looked at things like equality, um, freight and goods movement, data, data is big, efficiency and the environment and congestion. These are all things that were we're thinking of every day, but how do they fit into what we do on our daily uh, lives? Um, so they, they also came up with more than half of the city said uh, the potential is there to test automated shuttles. We heard that this morning um, from some of the legislators on implementing that in, um, in airports or, or maybe a, um, a state park and getting uh, you from your your parking lot to the state park entrance, let's say. That, that's a great applicability, right? Um, looking at uh, electric vehicles and, and what we do with data and how we um, look at funding and, and using the data to make better funding decisions. 
Um, my, previously before here, I was with the uh, a planning commission. So I'm, a, I'm an engineer that worked at a planning commission for almost 19 years. So I have kind of, some would say a warped sense of what all of that means. You know, the planners and the engineers think, think a little bit differently, but um, it's really influenced how I, I, I see things. Uh, it's not just uh, the technology and, and the engineering side. So overall, this, this market of smart cities and why it's so important is, is increasing. That's all that this is really telling you. Um, and like I said, this improvement in quality of life and how we live our lives, it it's, uh, should be one of the foremost things that we think about as we go along. Um, so in 2017, uh, Eric Runzel, uh, he with ITE, Institute of Transportation Engineers, which I'm, I'm a part of also, they did a um, study for um, looking at kind of an update of that US DOT Smart Cities Challenge. And this is the case study I, um, I'm presenting with you, to you now. Um, so over 246 survey response, that's a pretty good uh, response rate. Um, so the, um, the feedback was that smart, smart communities, and we say smart cities, but it's really smart communities because it can be in any scale, right? So it's a subject they're interested in, and they should consider it for, for future planning. And 70%, uh, so this is, they're wanting to do this, right? So how would you rate your awareness about even? They want to do it, but their awareness is about even. Um, TSMNO is Transportation Systems Management and Operations. So that's telling us that um, they think it's very important for operations and maintenance, and that leads into funding. Well, um, in your long-range planning efforts and your transportation improvement programs, you need to make sure to put money in for operations and maintenance because you can, you can put something in right now, but if you don't continually pay for it, and allow for new technology to come in to pay for that, then where is it going to go? It's, it's not going to go very far, right? So then the question is, how would you, what, which elements would you like to learn more of? And it was this, uh, you can't see all, but connected vehicles was the number one. So they equate smart cities with connected vehicles. The second one is this intelligent, um, intelligent sensor-based infrastructure. So how do we connect the infrastructure to this connected vehicle world? Um, and there we go, that's over 60%. And the least is, well, one of the most important also is this smart land use. That gets into the kind of planning. So how do you, um, where do your commercial developments go? Where do you, know, do you have this um, transit-oriented development? And what is, what is going to layer on to each other to help make a better neighborhood, community, city? So in, in what appealed to you? Similar, very similar. The connected vehicles and the intelligent uh, sensor-based uh, infrastructure. Over 50%. Smart land use came, came in a close second. So there's a great demand for the smart cities and the CAV uh, information. And also what came out of this is this DSRC, Dedicated Short Range Communication, that's the traffic signals, working with the traffic signals. And they equated that with automated vehicles, with connected vehicles and smart communities. All that's, that's, that's an important takeaway here. So these overarching ideas is that we want to use this technology to improve communities, not just for technology's sake. Um, User-based, uh, think about your traveler, not just um, you know modes, but the traveler. How did they get from one place to the other? Um, my 11-year-old, I asked her, uh, you know, in these connected vehicles, what do you think happens to a car when they drop you off at work or at school, or what do you think happens to them? And she said, well, mom, it just has an app to know where to go. So she, in her mind, she just, well, the car has an app engine right now we'll just know where to go because it communicates somewhere with something and and then i said okay well i think that's happening now um and i asked my eight-year-old well, well what should you do in a car that drives itself she said well everybody needs coloring books obviously right so they can just 
spend time doing something else. But that's, it's interesting. They, they just take it for granted. They don't say, well, that'll never happen. Because in their world, that's going to happen. Just what, what happens with the car? What, what do you do afterwards? That's where they're thinking. That's, that's the next generation coming up. And are we prepared for that? And if not, how do we get prepared? So thinking beyond the vehicles is, uh, is kind of an everything planning. It's that smart cities thinking, smart communities. It's, it's uh, not only just right here at Phoenix or just in, at Gannett. It's, it's really connecting everybody. And we're here and we're, uh, we're making partnerships and, um, at this conference today and all the conversations we've had. Um, as well to move this forward. Um, I want to bring up, because I did come from Planning Commission, the American Planning Association uh, has this AV policy, same things that we're thinking about here through this whole presentation. And uh, what they're talking about is really not just smart communities, it's CAV goals, right? It's really the same thing. So we're all on the same page, talking, we talk, heard about different languages, we're all a little bit different languages, but what's the intent? What's the purpose? It's pretty much the same, right? And if they're not the same, why aren't they the same? Um, so these disruptive ideas, um, talking about uh, uh, data and transit and, and your Uber and your Lyft and, and all that, they are really partnership opportunities in my eyes. Um, because we all need to be on the same page, speak the same languages, go towards a better quality of life, and thinking about how data can leverage um, different systems to make better decisions, better funding decisions, better planning decisions. Um, all these different ideas, they all, they're all tackleable, if that's a word, but we can all tackle them together in some way. So yeah, we're at this crossroads, right? And um, is the formula complicated or not? I don't think it's that complicated. Could be, depending on what level you are. Um, do we have the drive? Will we wait? Um, thinking about Skyport that we, we showed you this morning, um, that's an excellent example of the future. Um, when Gannett was working on the Skyport, there were all the different departments in, in, in Gannett came together the elevator people, the power, the infrastructure. And it's a great example of a lot of different um, groups coming together for a common mission. But we, we need to think about what does this mean for the user too? You know, you can put this in place, but will the user accept that? And um, kind of vulnerabilities are in that. And how, how will it benefit the user in some way? and a diversity of user in, in all um, economic backgrounds. Can they use that? So that's, that brings us to the human element. It's not this traditional engineering, and we need to bring that human element of, is this really going to help us um, as a society move forward? So I think that, oh, yes, I am done here. Um, and I, and I'm, I've not taken that much time because I'd like to answer some questions on perhaps my background or um, or what I've presented to you today in a, in a different way um, maybe that you've heard other presentations not as technical but hopefully it has you thinking a little bit 